All right, everybody, today we're going to be going over another book here. Uh, we're going to be going over Thorstein Veblen's Theory of Business Enterprise. Veblen was a uh, Norwegian-American economist, and this book is very interesting because he wrote a, a, a lot of the things he speaks about here are kind of things you see a lot of later philosophers or sociologists talk about, I guess you could say, um, Elul is probably someone who's similar to Veblen in a sense, especially talking about the uh, issue of like technique and machine. And also Ted Kaczynski kind of talks about some of the same things that Veblen talks about and actually going on does as well when it comes to the, uh, the, the way that modern industry relates to the uh, world of tradition and, and traditional forms of basically just living. But this book was written, I believe, in 1911 or 1912, so it's, it's pretty early into the uh, into the 20th century. This book was written, but its insights are actually very, uh, still very relevant to today. And I think Veblen is actually uh, an underrated economist. So, without further ado, we're gonna just get right into it here. So he says the structure of modern civilization is the industrial system. And the force which moves industry is business enterprise. Now, it should also be noted here, the uh, industrial system is going to be referred to as the machine process later on. Mechanism or technology is what maintains the system and is the basis for the current system which we inhabit. And business enterprise relies upon in order for it to work. Business and the businessman is what industry is organized upon. And this is why business is the force which pushes industry, and industry is a result of business enterprise, which is a result of mechanism. The way the businessman, and here he means the large businessman, organizes his business has an effect and determines the rest, um, if not only, of not only the path of his own business, but of other businesses. As competition is created and facilitated by the actions of other businesses relating to one another, and obviously competition creates new modes of behavior between businesses you're going to adapt your behavior to the behavior of other businesses for the sake of survival the machine process in industry is the organization of materials under machine appliance so what are some examples of this refining sugar chemicals or being uh, an electrician however it is not just mechanistic organization that makes the machine process what it is it is also the fact that the machine process entails the work of other appliances which are not which are not of the machine process. When, for instance, uh, we refine some mineral, we must have someone who is an expert in the chemical properties of a said mineral in order that we treat it with proper handling in the machine process. So, industry requires the existence of other industries for even one industry to exist. When we use a machine to reshape minerals, the machine itself must be of a paper, of a, sorry, of a proper uh, stature to refine those minerals. And therefore, technology here is influenced by uh, what it is working with. The machine is going to be adapted to the circumstances it faces. For example, an axe exists because it is a sharp and hard enough, and is sharp and hard enough to basically destroy a tree, and, it, and it's angled in a way to chop down trees. This is why Veblen says it is the materials using the machine to reshape itself. Which is, he doesn't mean this in a literal sense, since obviously minerals don't do things um, because they're inanimate objects. But what he means by that is like, the machines have to adapt to the mineral. And it is almost as if the mineral uh, or whatever, just take, take whatever natural substance you want. Um, it is almost as, as if the natural substance changes the machine because the machine has to adapt to the nature of the substance that it's working with and that's why he's saying it is as if the um, in this case the mineral is reshaping itself because the mineral is determining the the nature of the machines that are working or, or that are imposing itself upon the mineral I hope that's clear the machine process is one in which all machines involved are related to one another rather than simply fulfilling its role in an atomized sense. 
This is because technology needs to be maintained by other technology and sim uh, similarly, what one machine can't do, another machine can do. And this is how they relate on the basis that one is adapted to fulfill the role the other can't fill. Machines also support one another for their function to work. So for example, a lamp requires the existence of an outlet uh, with a way of having electricity flow through it and then, you know, all of these form to create like one mechanistic system. Now in the case of uh, industry being dependent on other industries, I'm going to try and use a more concrete example. And when I say dependent, I mean dependent not only for their existence but also just for their purpose. So like, let's say you have a farm and you're farming uh, wheat, right? Well, you need to have a wheat farm, someone who plants the, uh, the seeds, right? And then you're going to have to have uh, an industry that um, separates the wheat from the chaff, basically. And then you have an industry that's going to turn that wheat into flour. So you have three separate industries here, and they all kind of require one another. Because without the industry to turn it into flour, well, then there's really no reason to, to plant the wheat if you're not going to make stuff out of it. And there's no reason to um, have the industry that separates the wheat from the chaff if there's no wheat to begin with, because you need that you need the wheat to actually have the job of separating the wheat from the chaff, right? So you have all these sorts of um, uh, th these industries that that seem to be distinct are actually dependent on one another to even exist as industries. You know, you can't have a sandwich shop if you don't have a guy who makes. Um, bread for sandwiches and makes the uh, whatever you want to put in the sandwich so you need all these other industries for other industries to exist basically and like that that this is very similar to the I mean he does also say you need other technologies to maintain the existence of other technologies and that's a different argument or it's rather that's a different point he's making but it's similar in that it, they're codependent on one another Ted Kaczynski often talks about how um, you know technology requires the existence of other technology to maintain itself and it's, this is why you can't have just like an atomized set of technologies or whatever and yes that is true but it's also the case for industries or in businesses businesses require one another um, and that's also reflected in the machine process so I, I it's more it's pr probably better to put it as the machine process requires other forms of the machine process to even exist um, and you can just refer back to the examples that I used. So commerce and trade need a set of standards when selling their products. And because business organizes industry, we see that industry uh, adopts these standards, such as weights and measurements. And this then produced a uniformity amongst industry. This uniformity of machine and industry saves labor time and heavily uh, mechanizes and centralizes industry, making it uh, less craftsmanlike and creating a uniform process, saving labor and time. So basically, it just becomes more, uh, or rather less, unique in the way that products exist because now they just adopted a sort of standard to produce things on a mass scale. And if industry is going to ignore these standards um, set by the business enterprise, uh, they would actually end up, you know, they'd be producing an irregularity amongst production. Um, and this would then bring delay and malfunction of the desired product, creating a great loss. Uh, for that industry and thus because of this uh, there is an incentive to conform to the standards set by commerce. Even things which do not seem subject to standardization often are such as um, such as not only the product but the organization of human labor which would make sense because you know organization doesn't just apply to or rather standardization wouldn't just apply to the way things look but also the way things are made and if, if the way things look change and also the way things are being made are going to have to change as well. Those things are cause and effect are obviously linked to one another. Uh, service and communication become standardized as well. For instance, uh, roads, railways and the like become standardized. And for men to use them, they must follow the set of standards to keep them in operation. This is seen uh, in also how you know the mail system works for telecommunication. Uh, it all follows a set of standards to keep it operating properly. Life itself, as it gets more complex, becomes standardized since technology is something we use every day. And over, uh, and over more populated areas like cities, um, our means of living are also standardized in that we work and travel in a certain specific way to get to our jobs or whatever. 
Also, we organize our desires and needs. Uh, it's, that's also standardized too. And this phenomenon of scheduling and of the process of it, uh, the process itself of scheduling uh, and getting things done requires a set of practices determined by the machine process. The machine process in regards to factory or plants is reliant upon one another or are, are reliant upon one another as they all fulfill different roles. And uh, one thing is not done properly in a factory uh, if it affects the rest of the process and other factories that create that product. That's kind of what I was saying before. As it causes a delay in production. Even if factories not working on the same product can affect uh, each other, um, or mechanical processes at large can, uh, for instance, let's say a textile factory needs materials and it comes to be delivered by train, uh, and let's say the train system malfunctions, this now affects the textile factory because its materials haven't been delivered. Uh, once this occurs, the textile factory uh, really can't do its job anymore, and uh, the exporting business also can't do its job because there's no textiles to export. Because industry is determining is a determining factor um, uh, of business, the modern businessman puts his stakes in the machine process because it affects uh, business enterprise. This is contrasted with the days of old where the businessman would put his trust in the nature of God or luck when it came to the process of making a profit. Industry in its primitive form or in its pre-capitalist phase uh, was often directly overseen by the businessman and industry was much more uh, minuscule at this point. So it could be directly managed by business and it lacked, uh, standardized, it lacked standardization and had infrequent efficiency as it does now. However, now we have standardized industry because industry has shifted from simply producing to making a livelihood um, to producing to making a return on investments. As was mentioned uh, before, a small irregularity in industry can have um, a whole effect on industry, on the whole system of standardization. Basically, will, will be will be disrupted if there is a small blip in uh, in the uh, industry itself. So all machines work together. So obviously, the pace and the role they fulfill also demonstrates how they depend upon one another to fulfill the end goal of the machine process. In order to maintain this organized machine process, one must organize it, obviously, uh, and it is business which does the organization of industry, and the disturbances in industry uh, thus affect business, and likewise, the disturbances in business affect industry, as if something goes wrong in the organization of business, uh, its power and focus on industry also becomes affected. So Veblen is here trying to make a distinction between business and industry of the machine process, Business is concerned with the accumulation of profit, and industry is the catalyst for this, and it is concerned with the production, or just with production in general, of, of goods. Business, however, isn't always concerned with the well-being of industry, as the well-being of an uh, industry is not always the best thing for business. If there is a disturbance in industry, it can benefit a business owner, as this disturbance may eliminate competition. This is why business sabotage is a thing. So yeah, one one blip or irregularity in industry can also be a benefit for a certain businessman or whatever. Um, business is concerned with profit once again, and this is what makes industry work. However, because business only cares about profit, it doesn't have to care about the well-being when the destruction of well-being advances profit accumulation. Business will try and capture industrial territory not for the sake of maintaining industry, but for the sake of utilizing it for profit. And thus, industry here is only a, is, is only maintained for a transitory period, where profit can be gained and then thrown to uh, to the wayside when it becomes useless. For example, a businessman will purchase a railway for business, and because it makes it more strategic, this then leads to the indirect maintenance of industry, but only for the time being. Uh, so business basically exploits industry for its gain. This is where the tension between industry and the machine process kind of starts to culminate. With the capture of more industrial territory, business will use this to inflict loss. Um, and in using sabotage once again on other businesses, so that way they can gain from it. A business may intentionally destroy part of industry just in order uh, that its competition gets blown out. Once again, there is a tension between business and industry, just as much as there is a unification. 
business seeks to mobilize industry as much as it can, but only for its benefit. And if sabotaging industry benefits the owners of business, then this will occur. Industry itself is concerned with the production, not the gain of a business class per se. So businessmen will follow a set of ethics insofar as those ethics do not contradict with their desire for pecuniary gains. They follow a set of ethics amongst themselves as well to generate stability in the endeavor of increasing profit margins. When business was less standardized and thus more local, the relationship between business was much more personal and close. Because of this, the ethics between the two were much more present and uh, business was business as an enterprise was much more honest. Producers were careful about their reputation regarding workmanship and amongst business dealings. Business was much more honest as well because um, people knew each other more closely, and they began to engage in if people began to engage uh, in petty and personal quarrels, uh, it would affect them more. But as business expanded, they didn't really have to worry about that because it was less personal, and they wouldn't have to worry about the immediate consequences of doing such a thing. So the relation between consumer and producer was much more uh, honest once again because they had direct access to one another. And they would obviously face immediate consequences if they sort of transgress the immoral norms of the time. Now, with industry, uh, all dealings and transactions become less personalized. And therefore, it is easier to take advantage of people and not feel guilt over this as well. Because it's almost like you're just, you know, it's, it's like how Stalin said, you know, the death of one person is a tragedy, but a million is a, st a statistic. Because it, it feels less detached when you abstract it into this sort of numerical value. And it's the same thing in business. Uh, they may take advantage of, you know, one person and won't feel real or and will feel guilt, but a, a you know, a multitude of people is just a numerical statistic. It, it's just an abstract and personal thing, and there's nothing that can really weigh on one's conscious conscience after a while. So, advertising is often seen as a way of communicating a product or service to the consumer base and it is but it is also a way of competition amongst business and when advertising is done to generate profit it is also done to divert sales from one business to their own so sabotage here also takes place products being sold to consumers um, are not often about you know what is good for the consumer but rather what is the most vendable or in other words sellable uh, what sells is much more important than what is good or useful, although they can often overlap. The machine process is the basis upon which modern business moves and is mobilized. However, the principles of ownership and property are connected to business as well, and they predate the machine process. The order of standardization of the machine process inculcates a new form of thinking in the business in the businessman as the machine process changes the state of affairs he is confronted with. It also generates more materialistic thinking as machines are ultimately concerned with the material. The businessman thinks with a uh, now materialistic metaphysics, reducing all material phenomena, or re rather reducing all relations between cause and effect, and pretty much all relations to material relations. Vebel remarks on the ancient principles of the past stating that they uh, have kind of become irrelevant today as they don't assist in the growth of our culture, especially in industry. Uh, these things would be religion, clan ties, nationality, ritual, and loyalty. However, the one cultural norm that has lasted throughout time has been that of property ownership. And it hasn't faded across history as this concept of ownership is necessary to human cultural thriving. Although property ownership in its development is much younger than other principles, it is still very much a perennial one. Femmel states that due to the increase of industrialization and standardization, also known as the Industrial Revolution, uh, we have the creation of property rights as a way to adapt to the new environment which industry has created and uh, basically a new way of managing the industrial society. And then he kind of moves on to talking about credit. Credit belongs to uh, the two categories of the industrial process, the first being deferred payments or payments to another person. And the second being utilizing money for um, gain. So this is basically just handing out loans with interest rates. Now the distinction here is that uh, in the first we're speaking of the cost of credit. And the second we're speaking about the gain of credit. 
When a businessman takes out a loan, it is in his best interest to shorten the period of time to when he makes money as he will be able to pay back the loan faster with the unused credit and the less amount of interest will be accrued and he'll you know have to he'll end up just paying less than he would if he if he let it just sit there. Um, in order to do this, he may increase the speed and process of production to make a heavier return on the investment he has made in taking out such a loan. However, it is not always the case as credit often increases the value of the business without increasing the production output. So it, it can actually go both ways. Um, the businessman will take more credit in search of more immediate benefit and set up uh, his industrial assets as collateral. Um, he will take the risk of using loans because the short-term benefit is of more value to him than the long term. This then increase in profit gain uh, and this then increases the profit gain and because of this other business other businessmen must compete and engage in the practice of loan borrowing because if they don't borrow the loans then their business the value of their business will not be as high as those who did um, because their collateral basically makes them more valuable after you know and, and because there's more investment going into that business they're more valuable even if the production is not uh, hasn't increased. It's just simply the fact that more money has been given to this business. They are they are more valuable on that basis alone. It makes the other businesses less valuable in the economy. Now, um, it is important to note that it is not that the businessman uses these loans directly to purchase more property per se. Um, rather, he can increase the value of his business by having more access to industrial opportunities, and he could bid against other business other businessmen in this sense thus forcing the rest of the businessmen to take up in the game themselves. Of and that, that game is taking out business loans. Speaking more on loans, Vemblin once again makes it clear that the usage of loans increases the value of the business itself despite its material output per se. And industrial equipment uses, uh, used as collateral too becomes more valuable. This is because a person loaning the business uh, money needs to make profit uh, off the business in some way. Uh, this is... This is where the business itself becomes more valuable to the loaner along with its components, the components being the, uh, basically the means of production. This increase of business value has a compound effect in making the business able to utilize more credit and loans, thus inflating its value, which become a, a hassle for other businesses, which become less valuable over time as less money has been invested into it. The more, value, the more valuable the property, uh, in this sense the business, the more credit it can be afforded as an element of trust is present via the increase of value itself. And also, if you can give it a loan, the business alone, and it's more valuable, and if it doesn't pay back that loan, well, then you'll have more collateral to take. Is also, I'm sure, part of it. So corporations grow out of uh, smaller businesses or branch off from other businesses and replace previous ones. Uh, now, this is actually interesting because this reminds me a lot of how the juvenile states, the, uh, the king kind of comes out of the uh, the aristocratic families uh, and and this is very similar in that it's like yeah the uh, the big corporation comes out of the the series of smaller corporations it just has access to more resources and, and can create itself uh, much like the aristocrat well the former aristocrat does in becoming the king um, as the economy adjusts so does the state in order to manage the economy I mean, that, that's kind of a given. Uh, the market economy has transformed into the credit economy. Under the old economic system, the trading of goods was the sole means of market operation. However, in this new credit economy, not only are goods traded, but so is capital. Capital being money accumulated as profit, and when traded, the money is being used to generate more profit. Interest on loans is the chief example here. There is once again a discrepancy between business enterprise and the interests of the community. The community simply wants the business to produce more goods and services for the benefit of the community, whereas the business seeks a pecuniary or profit gain, regardless if they end up producing more or less goods. Veblen speaks more on the role of managers in industry. Now, the managers in a given enterprise do not own the corporation because um, of this, uh, you know, they, they may manufacture certain events within the corporation, that is the managers may manufacture certain events within the corporation, uh, which is of their benefit but not 
to the corporation as a whole or to the owners. For example, a manager of a factory may organize a fake industrial discrepancy in order that he can expand his power within the corporation and benefit from that. Now, this is actually very similar, once again, uh, to uh, James Burnham's idea in the managerial revolution that the managerial elite will utilize the state or some other means to make the capitalist class obsolete and thus consolidate power through the enterprise, through the business enterprise in some way. So there's also this competition between the new class that arises of the managers and the owners who, uh, who, try, who try and take over and, and gain more power. So we see here that the managerial types have a different will and interest than the owners of the corporation. We also see that those who uh, own intangible property such as ideas or investments have more control over these or over those than who own tangible or material property. This is because material property is often organized upon the, I the ideas such as uh, innovative patents uh, or they are uh, invested in making their value go up because of this. So prosperity or welfare uh, in society uh, used to mean the increase in production of goods. However, this has now changed to me the increase in the prosperity of business. Normally, prosperity is followed by depression. However, as business society um, advances, uh, we see that uh, we go from times of great prosperity to times of a general or mild static depression. The management of industry can be categorized into four different parts, according to Veblen. One, industry is organized on the basis of business investment. The more investment involved in an industry, the more organized toward the end uh, of the will of the investors will it become. Two, industry relies upon the machine process, and the machine process is not an isolated process as machines rely on one another to get the job done of the production of goods as well as the maintenance of the machines themselves. Each industry can benefit one another, and a business running a certain industry can manipulate the industry they run to sabotage another industry. Three, the process of industry guided by business involves credit relations. As credit or loans are a form of investment, and thus industry will be guided with the knowledge that other forms of ownership investment are involved and will be accounted for in organization. Four, business enterprise will utilize loans in order to further their business value, and this process creates a chain reaction amongst business competition to increase their business value as well, and they will thus utilize loans. When loan creditors give loans to a business, the business value increases, but in particular, the value of the means of production increases, such as the machines, such as the machines, and these things become collateral, meaning they are what will be taken if the loan is not paid back, plus its interest. When a stagnation or depression occurs in industry, it is really a result of a depression occurring in business, as business is the organizing factor of industrial production. This may occur when the business does not see any pecuniary benefit um, from increasing productivity and many times even a loss and gain if they continue to produce at a certain rate. This discrepancy here is often described by overproduction and underconsumption. However, according to Veblen, this is, there's, it's a lot more nuanced than this because it seems as the supply of goods will never be too much for people to keep consuming. Uh, as people will always consume and often don't really have the will to stop themselves. Uh, human wants and desires can basically infinitely be, be stretched if one wanted to do so. This is why addiction pretty much exists and why it actually advances as production occurs. So to the contrary, depression depressions are not marked by times of overproduction and underconsumption. They are marked by times of underproduction and falling from that underconsumption. Because there is nothing left to consume, that's why there is underconsumption. It is only in times of prosperity that we can see a abundance of production, as with that often comes an abundance of labor and job opportunities, and thus, of course, consumption. One cause of economic depression is the is that establishments of the same earning capacity are held to have similar value despite not having the same value because one is much newer and while one is a lot older. An economic depression is a quote-unquote malady of businessmen, which is to say it is a discrepancy of businessmen and its secondary effects are felt by the laborers in industry. When businessmen feel competition and investment is too high in a given field, they will join together to form a coalition to drive down output in order to lessen competition amongst businesses and uh, 
one could basically call this coalition a trust. Uh, this business trust can control output and prices as there is a mutual interest in reducing competition amongst businesses. Uh, this occurs so that all the businesses involved can reduce competition and keep their business afloat. So the businessmen will sacrifice their personal success over other businesses for personal security, driving them to unite here. Uh, this reduces production for the workers and, pro uh, and products for the consumers, lessening growth overall, making things uh, more scarce and their value inflating. So this is interesting because normally you think of like competition or business being ruthless competitors, but it, there's a certain point where they uh, would rather sacrifice competition and being on the top for just general security when they feel like the competition is getting too out of hand. Um, so economic depression is a discrepancy between capitalization or the value of a business and is assumed earning capacity. The business becomes valued more so than it actually should be. The machine process being something new historically had caused the institutions of society to ad adapt to it. Such as the law, for instance, had to adapt to this new field of human endeavor. As business developed and machine industry too, the state had to adopt or rather adapt to it and see how it could bring the institution of business enterprise under its domain. Business enterprise is often local to one nation and it will be in competition with another set of businesses in a foreign nation. Both of these will utilize their state in a way to supplement uh, their business against foreign business competition. Tariffs and taxation come to mind here. When capitalist nations go to war, they do so on the basis of securing peace for the businessmen proper to their country. They will engage in warfare on the basis that it provides further peace for trades overall and uh, benefits their nation as a consequence of benefiting industry. The phenomenon of machine industry grows out of the Anglo culture of Evelyn states actually paradoxically uproots itself and negates the culture becoming separate from it and antithetical to its uh, continuity, basically. The machine is devised by man, however man, and in particular the workman, has to become adapted to the machine process in the way he works and develops his skills since he is now working with a new set of tools as opposed to prior events. Much like how the machine itself becomes adapted to the materials it works with, the man has to adapt to the machine. The machine process shapes the mind of man uh, to think in terms of cause and effect and impersonal physical phenomena. The machine process also demystifies society as the mass of workers and the elite start to dis uh, discipline their habit of thought through the understanding of causation and effect which is required uh, to the use of the machine process. The machine process, which replaces the previous small workshop modes of production, generates uh, a society based around understanding the world in a material sense, and just basically material causes, because society now runs on a system that is solely concerned with that. The machine process doesn't care about morality as such, it simply cares about producing what it, uh, it is made to produce. The business class also has a notion of rights and ownership that are ideologically postulated as a universal moral axiom, and this moral axiom allows them to justify their actions and ownership over business. Society uh, needs a set of ideologies, or needs a set ideology in order to, in order that society can organize, and in order to organize harmoniously, there must be uh, an accepted standard of relations and morality. Society does not always base law on facts. It often bases fact on law, which is not how you're supposed to do it, but since emotion is a greater force in human beings than logic. Business enterprise is conservative in that it upholds a set uh, and a rigid set of moral axioms to justify itself, in this case natural rights. It will engage in skepticism, but not uh, skepticism toward anything that basically contradicts contradicts its um, affirmation of natural rights because that's the basis for its justification of ownership of business. And this is how it establishes a hegemony of power. The machine process does not uphold any existing institutions, at least in terms of values. As the machine process lacks values as it's an instrument and it only has a firm belief in the law of cause and effect, so it can't be conservative as it's not trying to maintain any institutions per se. As a matter of fact, the workers engaging the machine process eventually become resentful against the businessmen 
and we see unionism occur where they advocate for more say in the workforce. This unionism, uh, once it starts to question the values which uphold these institutions of business, natural rights that is, lead over in a sort of socialist ideology making the machine process more revolutionary than conservative as it actively undermines the values of past institutions which we say uh, which we saw previously with its replacing of a more uh, primitive mode of production like in feudal society where the machine process wasn't really present ultimately leading to a upheaval of that society into a more global and less local economy and also a more standardized one as well once it becomes more global especially if you can take anything away from this section it should be uh, that oftentimes the changes in human societal organization lead to creating a new um, state of affairs for groups of society thus creating new ideologies this is why communism came into existence as a product of the industrial revolution as it created a more coherent class of workers it is also why places like Russia and China adopted communism as they wanted to catch up with the West and saw uh, this as a means to industrialize fast and tag along with the rest of the world. Veblen states that unlike other forms of revolutionary movement, socialism doesn't seek redistribution, it seeks abolition of property rights. However, this becomes inconceivable and even the, the socialists eventually agree. Paradoxically, the socialists and conservatives both end up agreeing on the existence of property rights. When the socialists speak of equity, this, this assumes some form of property right or that they are entitled to ownership over some sort of resource. Because the habits of thought have shifted to become more materialistic, the working class of society have no concept or regard for the metaphysical as the conceptualization of such a thing doesn't fit to their thought process. This naturally leads to the undermining and dissolution of all traditional institutions leaving the individual in an atomized sort of state. Veblen states that the notion of cause has changed uh, as the machine process began to sprout. Cause was seen as a teleological and multifaceted thing. So for example, and he doesn't use this example, but I'm just putting this in here myself, uh, we see uh, in Aristotle the four different kinds of cause, those being formal, efficient, material, and final cause. All, all of these being equal in that they are causes, but uh, different in the way they cause things. As the machine process grew, cause was reduced merely down to the process, or just, in other words, the movement from state of affairs A to state of affairs B. The most famous example of this is the creation of man changing from the divine notion of man to the Darwinist notion of man being the product of a set of random processes as opposed to being the product of divine creation. Now, Veblen speaks on the decay of business enterprise. Now remember here that business enterprise is the machine process, and the and the machine process are distinct. Business cares about profit accumulation, and because of this, will organize the machine process in a way that benefits enterprise. The machine process is concerned solely with production and nothing else. The machine process requires business enterprise or some kind of enterprise to organize it and give it something to produce. Business enterprise and the machine process are intention, as the machine process undermines the more conservative or aristocratic elements of enterprise through creating new technologies, and thus new systems of thought and institutions. This leads to a social problem of, the revolutionary, of, of a revolutionary nature of the machine process and the aristocratic nature of business enterprise creating lines between proletarian and bourgeoisie. The machine process, as it develops and becomes more complex, will further undermine these elements out of necessity. And here we see the birth of socialism, the natural rights doctrine of the aristocratic class of his enterprise becomes undermined, and so does its religious basis. Along with this, the notion of natural rights can't reassert itself properly. Natural rights as a notion come to be during a time of peace, and to enforce them in a non-peaceful manner leads to contradiction. Allowing more peace will not work either way, um, as this will just continually allow um, the sort of morality set by business enterprise to be naturally undermined by the ever-moving tide of the machine process. So that there pretty much concludes Veblen's book, The Theory of Business Enterprise. Definitely recommend you check this out for yourself. Um, I think there was a lot of unique insights in this book, and I think there's a lot of things you can apply this to. Uh, it's This is not really elite theory per se, but it definitely ties into elite theory. So, well, that's about it.